Bloody fools. What were you thinking coming here? Have you any idea how dangerous it is? You're Aberforth, Dumbledore's brother. Harry's had so many challenges in his journey, his odyssey to kind of beat Voldemort, and the biggest is this moment with Aberforth. Do yourself a favor, boy, go home. Live a little longer. In a way, Aberforth is almost like the last test. He's like, he's giving me another chance to turn back and to pack it all in, actually. We're never gonna win this. And it's the moment when Harry decides to go, if I don't carry on with this, what am I gonna do? It was quite interesting because in a way, you're working on a blank canvas. It's this kind of guy who lives underground. He's very basic, he's of the earth. But once you're informed about the childhood memory of what happened with his brother, you play it through a memory and, and, and emotion. And you hope that all this will then present it visually. The makeup, I think, on Kieran is the best makeup that's ever been done on any of the films. It's astonishing <laughs> how that to, to make him look that much like Michael Gambon, while still there being just enough subtle differences for it to be a brother rather than an identical twin. It's very hard to find yourself in there. You know, it's, it's a fairly heavy disguise. It comes into three parts, really. What they've done is um, they've made me um, some little eye bags just in here that they then push into the skin. And then they've given me, which you can see from the eyes up, to give me this big forehead that Michael has uh, that I don't. And the only other thing is and the little nose, because mine's a bit crooked and uh, thinner. So, in fact, they've just added some features that then, in a way, transforms the whole face. The eyes are what do it. Because Michael Graham, actually, you, you don't really think about it at the time, but he has very distinctive under his eyes. It's very, very specific to Michael. That was what really sold it to me. Uh, Kieran just wore it beautifully. And he didn't let it affect his speech, didn't affect his movement. You just see somebody looking very natural. The fineness of the work they do, it's really special. So it was a great thrill to be asked to be in it. Jenny Tamemi, who I work with on these four films, is um, she's a storyteller. It looks dangerous, and that was the idea. She's interested in the kind of aesthetic of things, but she profoundly is interested in story and character. That's where she starts. She starts with story and character with costumes. It's really nice and elegant. The first, I start from the script because it's no costume without a character, and the characters are the one of the script. And, of course, it has been an evolution. One of the great things for me uh, as an actor is that Lucius has, has changed so much from the beginning. I think Lucius, by the time we get to the climax of the, the eighth film, has become a, a shadow of his former self. Look at me! It's not a very happy journey for Lucius, and you don't need to look very hard to see what's happened to Lucius. He lost a lot of his grandeur, and he actually became much more human than in the other film, because something in him is breaking. And we had to reflect that in the costume by making him a lot more dirtier and damaged and less perfect than he used to be. I always find Neville's clothing definitely helps me get into character, but it's because, because, you know, I don't like to dress like this when I'm at home. When he started out, it was very clear that he's grand dressed him. But Neville's always been, you know, buttoned up, right up there, tie, shirt to the top, robe on, very prim, very proper, and all the clothes have always been like three, four sizes too big. Wearing a fat suit for about six years, that was pretty tough. The fat suit sort of did help me get into character in a way because Neville was always described as brown faced. And et cetera. But it was so warm and, and it was very difficult to move sometimes and it did distract me sometimes in that respect. It's quite strange actually because it's it's different this year. Some of the clothes are a bit cooler than normal. And uh, Neville's really come along along a bit. This year they've gone for the cardigan as sort of a, a leader. 
Like in Order of the Phoenix, um, when Harry Potter you know, wore a cardigan as opposed to all, all the jumpers and tank tops the other students were wearing, it sort of gave the idea of a, someone who's a teacher. Expecto Patronum. Lupin had it in Prisoner of Azkaban when he was teaching, so Neville's sort of become the resistance leader now, so he's got a cardigan on. And, and then, obviously, battle-weary as he gets more and more, and this one, his clothes become more ripped, and he just doesn't care, he doesn't care anymore. It's far more important things at hand. Yeah. Part two is going to be a bit of a, a bit of a mix of it this year, so it's quite cool. And that's his character. <laughs> so he has come along quite a lot, Yes. you can see. Yes. taken over Hogwarts, he's become headmaster. He's turned it into a pretty grim place. All the magic's gone. It's like a prison. And Harry, who's their hero, hasn't been around to kind of be a figure for them. Harry Potter was sighted in Hogsmeade. And so when Harry returns to Hogwarts, like, everyone is just hype. This is what we've been waiting for. Should anyone attempt to aid Mr. Potter, they will be punished. I want you to listen to what Alan is saying, and I want you to be very afraid about what he's saying. Harry sneaks into the Great Hall and kind of chooses this moment to unveil himself. It is a huge scene. Take three. Jim Broadbent and Miriam Margulies and Gemma Jones, everyone came back, which is wonderful. And Alan is brilliant at that speech. Any person found to have knowledge of these events who fails to come forward. There's a speech in the Great Hall. The way Alan says a couple of words will be treated like equally guilty. Equally guilty. And Maggie was behind him. And I could see Maggie thinking, just get on with it, will you? But there's a way that Alan uses words and the space between words. If anyone here has any knowledge of Mr. Potter's movements? Which you hang on every breath and every pause. I invite them to step forward. And I think Alan's wonderful in the way that he's kind of made Snape who he is. Now. I've always enjoyed working with Alan. I mean, the way he thinks about scenes, the way he breaks them down, it's quite inspirational. So I think that sort of made me, forced me to raise my, my own standards. In many ways, Harry, of all the characters, I'd say, is the most difficult to play. He is the one who is the least defined in terms of his personality. And I think Dan has brought a real truth to the performance, and he really considers the reason behind each of Harry's actions. And finally, in this film, Harry steps out and confronts the man who he's loathed for so long. <laughs> Yeah, he really kind of steps up and yeah, he's a real hero, so it's, it's great to see that. And I've got proper action hero dialogue. It seems, despite your exhaustive defensive strategies, you still have a bit of a security problem, Headmaster. And then I turn around and the cavalry come in behind me and then I turn back and I say, I'm afraid it's quite extensive. And it's like, it's quite a cool, it's almost like he planned it. <laughs> I like moments like that, you know, I won't get to play action heroes forever. <laughs> It should be one of those moments that sort of just rouses you. I think the final battle in the second film for the Deathly Hallows is really going to be our greatest triumph in terms of the work that we've achieved. In the past, we've worked with a lot of miniatures, but we've built the whole of Hogwarts in the computer this time, so we're not using any miniature work at all. We've got this digital version of Hogwarts, which allows me to go anywhere within the school. Come on! And anywhere outside it, and gives me tremendous freedom to move the camera in and around the place when it's being destroyed. That was quite useful. But it's a phenomenal amount of work, therefore, that we have to create, as the school itself is under attack. 
Protego Maxima Fianto Duri Repello Inimical. So part of the story for the defence of Hogwarts was that the teachers at the school would produce what is essentially the mother of all shields that would protect the whole of the school. We spent a lot of time designing the look of this. It was important that it felt organic, but also we didn't want to end up with something that was visible once the shield itself had finished. And that was a design process that we went through to establish what this shield looked like. The idea was that as the Death Eaters would launch their spells, you would then be aware of its presence again once the spells started exploding on the shield. And there was a whole progression of the deterioration of the shield. You saw the weakening of the shield, so you began to get this idea that fine cracks were appearing in the surface. We were keen to make it look like it was actually burning, with the actual shield itself changing its state from being sort of solid and glassy into something more materialistic. And as the shield itself is collapsing, pieces of the burning shield are falling down to the school. And I thought that was beautifully filmed and worked very well. Been here, obviously, we've seen some, some pretty amazing sets, but for attention to detail and just grandness, the Room of Requirement this year was, was incredible. The Room of Requirements is a really fun space. It's a real achievement. It's one, in one of our biggest stages, and uh, there's a mountain range in Wales called the Brecon Beacons, and I said to Stuart, make this the Brecon Beacons of the Room of Requirements. It needs to go on and on and on, like this great big mountain range of discarded magical objects. Every corner has a beautiful top shot, wide shot angle. But if you look up here, these stacks are only a third height. So we'll go another two, three times these heights. It's an amazing set because it's probably one of the only sets that has ever been created only by props. There is no set. Well, actually, there is some set, but it's pretty buried. Um, in fact, I'm struggling to point out a piece to you. There's a piece, look, if you can pan around to the top of the pile of chairs there, you see that it is the same vaulted structure that the smaller version of this set was. So, so there, there is architecture, but it's, it's 65 feet above us. You can just see under here the, the cores, which are basically um, uh, scaffolding frames, like the one you can see over to my right here which are clad in just plywood and painted black, and then that provides a, a very convenient space for the props guys to attach with their dressing, because obviously it needs to be secure and safe. They literally filled it with just literally like more stuff than you can ever imagine, like old like World War II trunks and, uh, and, and chairs and tables and glasses. Right? I mean, it was instruments that don't exist. Because we've been shooting six films before over nine years, we have amassed a great deal of props and furniture. We're at um, an auction room about um, 15 miles away from the studio that we come to regularly. Today we're shopping for a variety of sets, so we enjoy just looking here and seeing things. We get inspiration for things that you don't know you want until you see them. We have got 72 containers of props from previous sets and they're quite empty now. <laughs> a lot of them are here and I think it'll be fun for kids to recognise things that they've seen previously in films and, well, it's ended up in the room of requirement.
So this is the uh, room of requirements scene. It's high energy, it's big action. What can go wrong? Spells fly left, right and centre. Crab can't quite control himself and manages to set the bloody place on fire. The sequence starts with us climbing up to the top of the room requirements where all these flames are flicking up. Tom pretty much did most of that himself. One more straight away, please. We had to rig that so that all of the furniture was shaky and wobbly while they were climbing, but of course was completely safe. We just want to make some of it a bit more rickety, so as they're climbing up, it moves a bit when they get their foot on it. You're right, it does look high. <laughs> Once we got up there, they had this incredible thing where we're standing on a table, and then all of a sudden, they just literally took off two of the legs, so it just pivoted on itself almost. Right foot forward, looking wobble wobble, and then you're going to turn to your left and grab. Okay, three, two, one, drop. There. You're preempting it. You're looking at it before it goes. They would go, three, two, one, go. And even before they said go, it's all grabbing hold of the thing and saying, don't let me fall. And actually, I was failing miserably. I didn't think I could do it, and I was like, this is not going to happen. It's a thing they're not used to doing, and they're still very apprehensive about doing it. It's just, you know, they don't want to try not to anticipate the table going. The look in their face, that is genuine. <laughs> And then one of the great stunt guys came up to me and said, it looks like you're not trying. Really, really have a go for this one. Three, two, one, drop. <laughs> and, yeah, we got the shot in the end. That's it. Good. That's Good. the one. It's brilliantly shot, so it looks natural. But of all the years here, that was the most terrifying stunt. I'm smiling now, only because my feet are on the floor, yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, Ron finds three broomsticks and it becomes an aerial chase. That was actually a really cool scene because we were all kind of on brooms, so it was good to be back on the broom, actually. It is the first time in a Harry Potter film that two people have been on a broomstick together. <laughs> we call it the rescue ring. We just had to reinforce the back of the broomstick a little bit so we can get two people's weight on it. This rig comes straight past me, and basically we link arms, and as he goes past, he pulls me onto the back of the broom. And they're just on their way out. The whole room is about to combust completely, and they're just about to make it, and they get through the doors, and they crash land. The challenge of this is it's a real-time stunt. It's a real impact on the floor. It's using a broomstick that's also going to get entwined on them. A two-person stunt is it's always more difficult because there's someone else involved and so you're not just thinking about your, your own self-preservation, you're thinking about someone else as well. They've done fantastic and they've not kicked each other in the face, which is good, but they have landed on each other a couple of times. You kind of feel a bit bad, but that's the way these things go, but it's sometimes more fun doing it with two people. Out of six takes, we've got three or four big favourites and it'll be a hard choice to uh, choose the best. I really liked the scene in the courtyard with the Voldemort monologue and Neville stands up to him. Action! <laughs> it's as if it's over and it's kind of like, there's no point in fighting anymore. Who is that? Hagrid's carrying. Neville, who is it? It was really my first scene and then we came into the studio and we went straight to the courtyard set for a rehearsal. Because uh, Ray's going to zap him if he doesn't do it and Rafe was there and I met him. It was the first time I'd spoken to him, but he put me at ease anyway very quickly and, and we had a really good time at rehearsing. And then we went back inside, got all the hair and makeup, got all the blood and the bruising and the ripped clothes. And then we went back outside to the courtyard and it was just so different to what we'd just rehearsed on hours before. It was really daunting at first, I mean, there was fire blazing. There was the bodies of students laid just across the courtyard. Uh, all these limbs kind of hanging out of the, the rubble. Just hundreds of Death Eaters in one place. 
and we got the perfect weather for it. It rained and rained and rained, so it really looked fantastically desolate. And of course, he who cannot be named does this fantastic, vicious, victorious speech. Harry Potter is dead! No! No! In this giant confrontation, Rafe was let loose, and he was utterly terrifying. Stupid girl! We shot it for weeks, and you never quite knew who he was going to turn on, what he was going to say, even. Well, I must say, I'd hoped for better. <laughs> it kept an entire courtyard full of extras and actors on their toes, because he could pick at you at any moment. And who might you be, young man? <laughs> He'd laugh at me in this way where he was sort of just ridiculing me and, and, and as if I was this just pathetic nothing. His name is... Neville Longbottom. <laughs> Is this truly the best Hogwarts has to offer? And it was just so effective. And I was just so angry at Voldemort that it just, it was very, very easy to get into the character. I'd like to say something. And he's battered in this story and he's bruised and he's broken. It doesn't matter that Harry's gone. But he gives a speech and about why? why they're not going to give up, which is suicidal. He's still with us. <laughs> it's kind of like, he must be insane. Everybody knows he's going to be killed. But yeah, and it was lovely to, to see yeah. Matt do that, and he did it really, really well. He didn't die in vain. Matt has put so much into these films, and he's, he's been so good, and he does brilliantly in that scene. But you, Will. <laughs> Harry's heart did beat for us. For all of us. And he inspired everyone to fight. This is not over! <laughs> That was awesome because... Demo! No! I just love the idea that anyone can do these great things. They just have to have courage. They don't need to be special. Let me get this straight, Professor. You're actually giving us permission to do this. That is correct, Longbottom. To blow it up. Boom! Boom! Ah! He couldn't even hold his frog together on the first film. <laughs> <laughs> so, to go from uh, someone who loves frogs to someone who starts slicing up snakes, he's, uh, he's certainly turned into quite a warrior and head of the resistance at Hogwarts, which is um, a very brave feat for Neville to do. He beats the bad guy, he saves the day, and that's what's driving him along, just instinct to do the right thing. To be able to play that over the last 10 years, that evolution of a character, has been incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible to see what all of these characters can do when they're pushed to the very edge. <laughs> In Mrs. Weasley's case, one of her children is about to be taken away from her, and you see Mrs. Weasley in this incredible fight with Helen and Bonham Carter. <laughs> It's a great moment in the book. It's a real crowd-pleasing moment. Who's next? <laughs> it was a great pairing, and I don't think we could have anticipated that when we cast them initially. They were dueling when the camera wasn't on. They were having fun, playing it out, and uh, having a laugh. <laughs> I was lovely working with Helen. She's such fun. <laughs> you know, right from the day one, when we came in, I said, you're going to get it, you are. You're going to get it in a couple of weeks. It's great that she kills me. I feel very honoured that she kills me. <laughs> Bellatrix doesn't expect her to be so good, so she's caught off guard. It's good to see two girls have a fight. They work very hard for that, and we've done that in an afternoon. We rehearsed the moves for a few days, and we showed it to them, and they put some of their own stuff in there. I think Mrs Weasley's is a little bit rustier, and, you know, and she's not as fit, and so her style probably isn't as fluid and uh, dramatic as, as Bellatrix's style. When we're doing it, of course, nothing's coming out of the end. It's hard to kind of react. That's why we had to have the first assistant shouting, block, one, two, three, four. You've got to make sure that you, you do it with real venom. You just have to go for it. Oh, come on, Reggie. You have to just play. I love seeing actors just explore and play. And in it, you'll find something that's really interesting. That's the sword fence. 
and I'll just say, that's not good, that's great, that's really interesting, that's completely weird and inappropriate, but that's fantastic. They really enjoyed that. Let's, let's go through that from the top. Yes. <laughs> It was really quite something to, to watch and quite scary almost because you could see the tenacity in each of their faces. Helena and Julia are probably two of the nicest actors in the, in the whole industry. And then as soon as they real action, you think, bloody hell, they're going to kill each other. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> it's really great because you don't really expect to see this motherly character to, to have this aggression. I loved the fact that she said, not my daughter, you bitch. <laughs> I loved it. And you would expect Bellatrix to be the most powerful, the most fit, because she doesn't care, you know, to be a, that, that gives you a certain strength. Yeah! Yes! Bellatrix doesn't really get this family. She just feels it. What are you on about? You know, you've got a spare, you've got other children. Why, why are you so hurt? You know, because she's got no conception of love, you know. She loves inflicting pain, and that's her only joy. <laughs> this shows what a powerful witch Molly Weasley really is. And so I could take on anyone now. I think really I should have defeated them. But anyway, I left that to others. <laughs> Eleven years ago, Oliver and I went for an open audition in Leeds. It's gone really quickly and it's been an amazing experience for us to be on. We've made some fantastic friends for life. Well, I'll say this completely truthfully, I'm working with all my favourite actors. It's just extraordinary. My overwhelming feeling is one of, of being slightly sad that it's all over. But at the same time, I'm also very proud to have been a part of it. It's changed my life massively. I've kind of grown up around some of these incredible people. Um, I've learned so much as an actor and as a, as a human being, really. I was inspired completely, not only in the acting side of things, but also in the technical side, the creative side. And so every time I was on set, I was fully aware that, you know, I was really lucky to, to be there. It's kind of been my life every day, every hour, it's, all, it's, it's what it's all been about. And to not have that anymore is quite emotional. There'll never be a frame of any of these films that I don't look at and connect immediately to a memory of this place or of somebody. I'll miss it and I'll miss my friends. We watch the cast grow up on the other side of the camera. And I think all of us have grown up, I think, as filmmakers. It was a place to be able to dream, and it was a place to make dreams come true. Any craftsman just wants to be able to do their best, and being put in a situation where you could is a fantastic thing. I've got to work with so many brilliant actors and the different directors, and it's been an amazing education. My life was transformed in the last six years, and I'm grateful for that experience. It's been so good. I, mean, I love the story, I love the way it went. And so to be making that film, you know, 10 years later, has been a dream come true. All the people involved from the top down love the stories. We all somehow guard its integrity and are aware that this has been a magical moment in time. I will miss Harry's world so much. And I don't think I'll ever work on something as fantastical and imaginative and creative as Harry Potter. So thank you to the fans, thank you, you've been amazing. I wouldn't have been able to go on the journey without you. Um, and thanks, most important, to Joe Rowling. Thanks for the gift of your books. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support over the past decade.